check out. Basically, uh, a very useful search tool for looking at environmental or gathering data on the environmental impact. Um, so, without further ado, I'll pass over to James. He's going to talk for 30 minutes and we'll take questions afterwards. Uh, clarifications you can ask for that. Great, hello everyone. So, Dan, I'm going to spend about the first half of the talk, maybe 10 15 minutes, introducing my new team and what we're trying to do in UCL. And then the second half of the talk, giving a few uh, tips on um, sort of how to apply good software engineering practice to computation based research. Um, if you already know that, then uh, apologies if it's patronising. Um, if you don't, then uh, it should be useful. Uh, if you know and disagree, then heckle me. Um, that would be great. I'm here to learn. Um, so, yes, yeah, so uh, we'll just uh, introduce me. I've been doing um, programming and research in a variety of areas. Um, sometimes it's a job in postdoc in, in a variety of different research groups as a programmer, and sometimes in industry, work for people who make MATLAB for a while. Um, I've uh, done a couple of biology gigs, physics, and as I say, the, the, the Amy thing. Um, that's not come out properly on the scanner. There's supposed to be a event. Oh yeah, it's good. you can just about see a blue circle there. It's a bit, it's a bit light in the room. But anyway, the, the idea is, you know, what am I, right? Uh, I'm kind of a researcher, and I'm kind of a software developer, and somewhere in that middle space, I think there's a role for people in, in sort of the research community. Um, it's been a problem, in my view, in computationally-based research to build good software that works beyond the life of the project, that people, other people can work on and understand, that's robust, that's reliable, that's correct. I think there's a lot of computational science published on whether the research is actually wrong because there's bugs in the code. Um, and it's very difficult to, to do that right. Um, it doesn't generally tend to work if you get general programmers off the street, you know, sort of uh, general software consultants, because they can't understand the research area, they don't understand the, the math, the modeling, the, the, the areas of, of understanding, and they're not equipped to rapidly learn a new research field for, by reading research literature. On the other hand, the, the model that's been most of my career of being a, a programming postdoc, you know, you're trying to build an independent research career, you're trying to publish papers, that doesn't give you enough space to focus on the creating the software and getting the software to be to be good, clean, re, robust, uh, you know, uh, high, high quality software. And you're not incentivized under those circumstances you know, you're not measured on creating good software, you're measured on publication output. Um, so that's why, in my view, uh, you know, we, we, I had a, a position paper on this with, with Software Sustainability Institute and um, SCFC and others. Um, so what we need is this um, uh, expert collaborative support model. So part of the research community, not measured on research output, you know, we're measured on creating good code, we're working with researchers as collaborators. Um, so that's what my team is trying to do, basically. It's a new initiative, don't know whether it will work. Um, we, uh, we're based in UCL within the sort of central IT, IT division, so the same people that like and look after all the basic systems, but we're a group of people in there with PhDs and long research experience. Um, there to be part of the research community, creating and crafting software, maintaining software, and, and I, I believe strongly that this research software engineer role, this research software developer role, um, is something that uh, the academic community needs um, as, a, as a way of, of resolving this, what I see as a very severe problem in the quality of software that is produced uh, as an output from research. Um, what are we doing in the new team? Um, so I guess the key focus, the principal one thing I put first, is you know collaborating with people like you, being you know being uh, and trying not to have very heavy walls between us, but working together as, as programming within um, things, you know consultation and advice on software architecture questions, on how to recruit software developers, and how to manage software development activities, um, consultation and training. We'll see more of this on different slides. We're also working on software development infrastructure, so that's things like central UCL version control, issue tracking. Uh, testing servers and so on. I'll come into that more detail later in the talk. Um, and we're also uh, looking to help people move on to their software that runs modeling software and so on, onto new technologies, so getting it to run on. Yeah, UCL has access to um, the UK's biggest and until last spring, the uh, Europe's biggest general purpose graphics card computer. So um, helping people get their code running on that. But I do want to emphasize, we're not mainly, we're, although we are interested in and active in the HPC supercomputing space, we're not only or mainly about that. 
you know, the bulk of software that is written by researchers, the bulk of software that underpins the research effort, and without that being correct, the research could be incorrect, is not running on supercomputers, it's running on people's desktop managing all their data. And I'm just as passionate about bringing good quality, sustainable, readable software code into that level of code than I am about the, the stuff that runs on supercomputers. Um, so we're part of ISD within this new research IT services department, which is basically the people in ISD with PhDs. Um, <coughs> The, uh, and we've, there's an academic governance structure that uh, controls our activities, so which projects we work on and so on isn't made up by me. You know, there's a peer review body that determines that. Um, your own Andrew Smith is uh, um, the chairman of the, 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 the bottom body of that governance structure. Um, uh, we are three permanent staff, um, me as a team lead and two others. That's a drop in the ocean. Uh, compared to the amount of computational research, computationally based research that's being done in UCL across all the subject areas. Um, we're hoping to grow through being involved in, in research grants with people. Um, so, engagement models. This is a very testy slide. I apologise, but I want to go through this in detail because I'm hoping to draw up some business, some people to collaborate with from this, from this seminar. Advice and consultation is free. Anyone has any issues around research software, just get in touch. Me or one of my team will come and have a chat with you about uh, issues around how you use computers in your research. Training, we go, we're working very extensively at the moment on, um, uh, hopefully by next term, we will have a comprehensive training program on uh, you know, in, in programming languages, but also importantly, what you do after you've learned to program, how you turn your program from something that you typed in to something that's sustainable and readable and works, best research best practice. Um, so that's gonna be a big part of our training. Uh, as an early part of that, um, you should be seeing an advert in the near future for a uh, so, um, what we call software carpentry boot camp, which is a couple of days um, on that sort of, you know, you know how to program, now you need to know how to program in, in, a, in a sustainable fashion. Um, and um, that's, uh, that's pretty exciting. So software carpentry is sort of <coughs> software engineering, you know, it's the, the beginnings of software engineering, the practical, the really practical nitty gritty of it. Um, Right, and then there's ways in, we actually, in which we actually come and do programming on your projects. Okay? There's two, um, three main ways you can actually come and do programming on your projects. There's a, a termly call, once every quarter, call for proposals for projects. The first one of those is uh, currently in the process of, of going through peer review. Um, the second one of those will open in April. Um, for that, you get half of one developer for a term. Okay? And the focus there is on, thing, on unlocking projects that need some uh, robust software engineering to really make them able to put in for more grants and so on and that kind of thing. You know, it's, it's focusing on research priorities. Um, and again, we focus on things where our skills are most useful, where, the, where combining the, 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 you know, the, the, the academic background with the software development skills is, is most valuable. Um, that's peer reviewed by the executive body that, as I say, I just missed it. So. Um, then, if you have do, putting a grant in for, for uh, sort of some research where you believe that some programming effort will be vital to you know, the course of your grant, uh, you can put in through PFACT for uh, sort of some effort from our team. It doesn't have to be a whole person, it can be 20%, 30%, 40% of an FTE. Um, we're up and running on that with PFACT. Um, we've actually put in the 300 k stuff is currently with research councils being um, reviewed. We've only existed for six months, so none of it's actually come through yet. Um, and that's how we plan to grow the team. Okay? That's how we plan to move beyond the three, the three staff we've got already. So anyone who's, who's putting in proposals where they're thinking about it might be useful to have someone with a programming background to, to, to work with you on that, then, then I would encourage you to get in touch with me and we can talk to you how you've got that. Second, if you've got some money lying around and you want some programming effort or on the smaller thing, then we can uh, sell out on a day around. So basically, advice and consultation and training is free. Um, actually doing uh, programming work is either free through the peer review of the, of the governance body or paid for through research grants. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, what are we doing on infrastructure? Right. So I'll be talking more about why these things are useful in the second half of the talk when I talk about um, uh, when I talk about some tips for, for good computational science. Um, so if you don't know what any of those mean yet, don't worry, you will by the end of the talk. Um, these are tools that make it possible, that basically you, if you were working in a software company, they would be there and you would be using them to work on, to, to, to underpin your programming. We're trying to provide that into all research groups. Teaching and training, I've talked about that. You know, this is, this is the real core point that I want to make is lots of people 
learn during their undergrad programs some programming, you know. But they never learn what you learn after you've learned the program, the next stage, how do you make your programs readable, how do you make them reliable, how do you make them fast. Um, uh, that's what we're focusing our training efforts on. And as I say, there's a software carpentry thing coming up. I'm also of the opinion that there should be a community in UCL of those of us who are scientists and researchers who come to work and the means by which we do our research is programming. And that, that, that can actually be a community across research fields. If you are a person who is a, a computationally based researcher, you can learn a lot in techniques and tools from other computationally based researchers in widely varying areas of, of research. Um, so I'm trying to build a community around that through this seminar series called um, Research Programming in Practice. It's now the name slightly out of date, apologies for that. Research Programming in Practice, it's a seminar series. People talk on, on various issues and tools that they've used in the research to have helped their research um, and, uh, and trying to use that to build a community of, 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 of computational researchers across subject areas. There's also, we're going to be probably not till next year now, setting up a more academic seminar. This is very practical, right? This is tips and tricks for, 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 that you can use in your day-to-day -day work when you come to work and sit down at the computer. This is more academic. This second <coughs> seminar series will come to start soon. And this is more about getting stuff that's going on in computer science departments used in computational science, you know, used by people doing, doing research with computers. Um, uh, you can read our blog, follow us on Twitter. Pause in case anybody wants to write that down. Okay, so that concludes the um, first part of the talk, which is an introduction to the research group and what we're trying to do with the new team. Um, so I'd uh, love to take some questions on that aspect before moving on. Yes? That's, that's excellent and laudable. That's fantastic. Um, the question I have is, uh, what is the current response time to questions, practical programming questions you have at the... Um, so... The, um, I mean, at the moment, if somebody wants to get in touch and arrange a meeting to chat about their research, I'm usually able to arrange a meeting within a week or so. But um, it's, uh, you know, we're not we're not working with people, and I don't want us to be working with people through the medium of firing up a quick question, you know, just fix this bug kind of thing for me, because I don't think that's transferring the skills into the research groups. Right? I'd rather get a deeper engagement that lasts a bit longer than simply um, emailing a, you know, my code is broken, how do I fix it kind of thing. We could do that, but I don't think that's making the most of the opportunity of what we're trying to do. So what we want to try and do is, do what we're doing with all of our projects is during the last phase of the project, not just producing the work that we've produced, but trying to transfer those skills back into the research group. So, so you know, we're not trying to hoard our knowledge about, about software engineering. You know, we want to see the biggest thing is to make, is to get researchers across across all research fields taking their software seriously. You know, now there's some other things that stop people taking their software seriously, like um, does it, uh, it, is the RAF giving proper credit to people producing good software, for example? Well, that depends on the panel. Um, some of them are, some of them aren't. But you know, what we want to try and do is, is spread the, the knowledge and, and the importance of producing robust software and how you produce robust software across research. Um, yeah, so um, bottom line is uh, we prefer to engage by actually having meetings and sitting down with people and having consultation and advice sessions. Now, that means you know coming and joining your research group, chatting through some tooling, tooling issues, chatting through the structure of your existing code, reading, read, having read the code. And um, it should usually within a week or a fortnight at most, we can arrange one of those, one of those sort of consultation sessions. Um, so from four or five close so far. Anything else? Um, where do you draw the line between uh, um, sort of software development and commercialization, um, right. and also software development and modeling? So let's do the first question first and the second question second. Um, uh, between, in terms of the commercialization question, mm -hmm. um, so productionization, taking software that basically works within your research group and making it so that so a third party can download it onto their desktop and, and it works for them, mm -hmm. right, is a long process. Mm -hmm. okay? um, there is value in every stage of that chain. Going from only the academic that wrote it to their colleagues within their research group and wrote it is a hard piece of effort. Mm -hmm. Going from that research group can use it to another equally skilled research group in a different HEI can use it is also a lot of effort. And then finally, of course, commercializing it is, a, is still a lot of effort. And all along that chain, we can provide value. Now, I, I don't make any, any particular um, 
I think most of the work we've done has been from point one to point two, from point two to point three, rather than point three to point four. Mm. But we're we're in, we're working with UCL business on strategies for, for 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 that last part as well. You know, if you look at the Elucid platform that people have now for um, for taking UCL UCL B, have got a platform for basically advertising UCL software and taking fees for it. So we want to develop our our, our work with UCL B on that commercialization piece. But as I say, routes to impact from software and research. Go far, yeah, are, 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 are other than commercialization as well. I mean, I, I had experience from, uh, you know, the, the company I was working for uh, had some, some of its uh, work was open source, mm -hmm. and so there are business models about generating revenue from open source software as well as from actually selling the software itself. You know, you can mm -hmm. open source software and generate revenue from consulting, for example. So I have some expertise in that area, and I can chat to people about software licensing issues, GPL, uh, BSD, etc., those kind of things as well. So, yeah, that's a very interesting space, and, and you know, um, uh, strategically, to start with, I'm focusing on the more, the less mature projects from the point of view of commercialization. But um, as we take the group forward and, and grow a bit, I think getting involved in the commercialization spin outside is, is going to be an interesting thing for us. The yeah. second question about the boundary between modeling and software. Mm -hmm. So, this is really interesting. Um, lots of models take the form of some kind of script file or some kind of model definition file. My view is that. Lots of software engineering practice around making code readable, around version control, around testing, apply just as much to model definition files as they do, you know, if your model is defined as a, a modeling environment. Um, I know Sysvaji uh, quite well, so SBML is a markup language for defining cell reaction network, protein reaction networks and cells. Um, so people wouldn't view that as programming as such, but defining your model and executing your model carries out, it has a lot of the same feel as, uh, as, as, as as software, and so in terms of in terms of that kind of thing, but that I think is very much a grey boundary. And certainly, I would say that things like you know when we go on to talk about things like version control, you should be version controlling your model definition files in just the same way as you version control software. So I, I'm not sure it's possible to draw a clean line between what counts as a program and what counts as a model definition file, um, uh, particularly when you're doing things like. Um, running the model lots of times in parameter space sweeps or stuff like that, you know, it's a very programmatic activity. Um, <coughs> anything else on the, on the first part then? Yeah, I was just wondering, are you going to look at the development of uh, code libraries in any particular Yeah, way? so one of the things we're interested in doing is where there are research groups that uh, we're working with and then aspects of the code that they've produced which we think can be taken out into a module and used by other research groups to start curating that as a UCL library, yeah. as it were. Um, so, for example, I did some work on making it easier to automatically deploy programs from your desktop into the into the UCL Legion, which is a, a <coughs> UCL supercomputer. And that's something that I, when I was working in a previous job um, in Peter Copeland's group, um, you know, was built for that particular research program, but actually could be applicable beyond beyond that particular research program. And I'm, I'm keen to find opportunities to pull bits out of research programs and then turn them into into shared tools. Um, obviously, all this needs to be resolved, right? So, you know, um, so that's that's definitely on the list of aspirations. Put it that way. Um, and and you know, okay. yeah, um, yeah. Can you comment on which software languages your team has experience with? Not um, sort of platforms, things like GAMS or AIMS. So, um, my personal experience is C, C plus, Fortran, Ruby, Python. Visual Basic, um, JavaScript, uh, Perl. Um, I've done a lot of different programming languages. Platforms, MATLAB, obviously I know a lot of MATLAB because I worked for MathWorks for a while, Mathematica, um, all the members of the team fairly similar. I mean, we're, we're, what we're about really is having seen enough of computational science to learn a new area fast, right? I mean, I think it can work that, uh, you know, um, once you've seen a few different areas of computational science, it's fairly easy to skill up by reading some papers and, and, and some modeling literature and so on and, and, and getting to grips with that. There's not that much difference between uh, you know, um, programming in one language and programming in another once you've programmed in five. Um, that, when it comes to things like Yams and Ames, you know, some more specific, more tailored environments, the SPML example I gave you is another one in, in life sciences. Um, that may take a little bit longer. I mean, I haven't got any experience. Personally, I haven't got any experience of those, of those particular skills, but you know, it's our intent to cover all those bases. It's just going to take um, take projects, basically. Um, you know, when you work with us, we're going to be spending 
some of our time learning your learning your environments, um, you wouldn't be paid for that. Uh, yes. Uh, websites programming. Um, so I have uh, personally got quite a lot of experience, and I know uh, one of my team members has as well um, in uh, Rails and Django and that kind of thing for, for doing for doing website programming. However, I would say that if it comes to vanilla website pr uh, programming. Um, without any sort of research, where, where, need, where understanding your research isn't useful for creating, for creating the, the work, then we're the wrong people. I mean, we want to focus on things where the research software engineer portfolio is, is the sweet spot. So combining research knowledge and background, mm -hmm. and, and understanding how, 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 how research works with the programming skills. If it's, if it's, so well, something like, about, something like that, for example, is integrating models with, uh, and, and their output and running them on websites and to modify websites and dynamic help files, etc. Yeah, so generated portals, by models. So portals into modeling, for example, where understanding issues around model management and how you manage parameter spaces and that kind of thing from a web interface point of view, I think that would fall within our within our space. Mm -hmm. Basically, if, if it involves understanding of modeling or research or, or that kind of thing, in order to do the engineering effectively, then you would have a fairly good chance of, of, of that passing the, the review body. And, but it, 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 and including, for example, I don't know, uh, d doing modeling and mapping using Google Maps API. Yeah, so I use Google Maps API. Yeah. Um, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Keep on going all day. Um, uh, the interface between software and hardware, so if we were trying to optimise battery life over distributed sensor networks? Um, not within my experience and expertise. Uh, there, are people with, uh, there are people within RITS, within the wider research IT. Mm. So ISD's got this, this new uh, department within ISD, which is about more people who are more part of the research community and, and supporting that kind of thing. So, mm. You may find that the research computing platforms team, or even the Silvers team, will be interested in, in that. There's also, just to talk about the other bits of RITS, there's um, uh, research computing platforms, which are more or less sort of hardware and systems administration as well type people. Uh, so Bruno Silver is, looks after that. And then there's RITS, UCL Research Data, which Max Wilkinson looks after, which is you know managing your data, managing metadata around the data, providing big storage infrastructure, curation, long-term Road safe storage of data and that kind of thing. Um, there's also Bruno, uh, sorry, Max also liaises with a group within um, uh, a different part of ISD for providing things for uh, identify. There's a project around identifiable data, so it's things where there are legal issues around patient identifiable ID, data, data storage, and that kind of thing. So who does that? Um, I can't remember the exact person, but Max can put you in touch with them. Um, sure. Max's group doesn't do that, but there is there is a group that does. Max who? Max Wilkinson. Um, so there's another group, I can't remember exactly who they uh, were. Probably the best person to contact in the first instance for any of these queries about who in RITS is the right person to talk to is um, Joe Lampard, um, uh, who is the facilitator for basically the whole of you know, RITS activities. Um, so yes, um, I'm going to move on to the second half of the talk, I think, and we can come back to these uh, institutional questions after this science. So these are my three top tips for good computational <coughs> research. Um, automating workflow, automating tests, and version control. Okay, the first one of them, automating your workflow. Repetition leads to boredom. Boredom leads to horrifying mistakes. Horrifying mistakes to God, I wish I was still bored. <laughs> okay, that means if you're doing any kind of repetitive activity in your research, stop and write a program that does repetitive activity for you. Right? This is not only for the sake of the reason listed here, but it also makes your research reproducible and auditable, because the script, of the automation script, is an auditable, re uh, reproducible thing of what you did. Okay? So this is how things should be. I've got some command line interface, fetch a data set, run the model with that data set, examine the results. The results is somehow stamped with the data set that was used for the version of the software that was used for producing it, so it's fully reproducible and there's an audit trail to go back and see what you did. Okay? This is what you should aspire to. Right? It can take a while to get there. Okay? A good way of doing that is to learn Python. Okay? If you want a nice easy programming language to learn for doing that kind of scripting activity and, and, and in, uh, instrumenting your research in a repeatable fashion, Python will be my recommendation of choice. There's a lot of tape of it in the research community. Okay? 
That's tip one. Tip two is testing. Does my model give the same results as last time with the same data? I want to be able to do that automatically. So I'll record the result and I'll write a script to run the model and check the results are the same. And then whenever I change the code, I just type run my tests and it will say your results have changed or your results are the same. Okay? We always we spend a lot of time when we're programming, running the program and seeing if it still works, seeing if it's producing reasonable output. Lock that down. Write a script that does that automatically. If you can, instead of just checking it gives the same answer as before, check it gives the right answer. Okay? So you take an artificial simple problem within your space that's solvable by hand or in, in some other tool, write that result down and check that result against the actual result instead of just what happened last time. Okay? And you can do that for a few if you can do that for a few simple cases, which are solvable by hand, then that will so that will make a really robust test. For even more robust tests, don't check the whole program at once, check each subroutine. Right? Sometimes it's much easier for a given for, uh, for, for one particular uh, line of your model or whatever to see if you've typed that incorrectly. You know, have I put a plus sign when I should have put a minus sign when I was transcribing it from the algebra in my notebook into the program or whatever. Right? You can test that with a few simple test cases. Try things like all zeros or you know things where things where the answer's obvious, you can work it out in that level of mathematica or by hand in your notebook. And make that be the expectation for your test. Build up a suite of tests and you can run them all with a simple command. And then what you can do is, and we're providing the infrastructure for this, have it so that all those tests run automatically every night, or even better, every time somebody changes the code, and you get emailed if you've broken any of them. This is incredibly valuable. This saves enormous amounts of problems. Let's say you've been working, you, you had a paper um, which you submitted a few months ago. Then the referee comes back and wants one extra graph, right? You want to know that the code is still working or not, with all of the, the changes that you've made in the interim. This kind of thing, so that if you break anything, you'll get an email from a robot saying you broke your code. One of the tests, one of the obscure caller cases, is now giving a different answer or a wrong answer um, because of something you changed and you didn't think about that aspect. If you do this, that problem will not happen to you again. Okay, this is awesome. Three, use version control. So lots of you probably have bits of code sitting on in folders on your computers with uh, version one, version two, version three, with differently named folders. Stop doing that. Use Git or Subversion on Mercurial to have that automatically. Then you can type a command and it'll go back to a particular version. It also helps you share and merge your work with your colleagues. So bear with me through this slide. What is version control? Right. So I've got some command, my VCS is for this purpose, some command, which is a version control system. It might be subversion, it might be Git, it might be Mercurial, it might be CVS, it doesn't matter. I've just made up a syntax for one particular one, for example. Time, time is running down. These are the commands that Sue types in. These are the command that Jim types in. Sue checks, her, checks the code out, uh, checks the code into the version control system. Jim checks the code out of the version control system. Already you've got code sharing, right? The code's moving fluently between the server. Then Jim commits some work. Sue updates and gets Jim's work into her computer. She does some programming. At this stage, they're both committed work to the same file. Oh no, they're both wanting to do work on the same file. That's a disaster, right? With a version control system, that's not a disaster. The version control system will suggest a way of merging that work. You review it and see if it's right. If you use a good one, a modern one like Git, most of the time it's right. It's incredibly powerful. You can have three or four people working on the same file and resolving the conflict between your work. And if you've got good tests, C tip two, then checking whether or not the, the merges work correctly is simply a question of running the merge and then running the tests. Okay? So, that's the story. Here's how it is with um, the git. Here's a particular syntax with the git command. I won't particularly show you, but one of the nice things is Jim has a repository on, the, on his computer with all of his history. Sue has a repository on her computer with all of her history, and then there's a shared origin on some, on some server space somewhere, which contains the merged history, and they're both interacting with the history, sharing work between them, pushing and pulling work between one another, the history's moving forward. Um, one of the really nice things uh, you know, about that is uh, you, can see, uh, you can see the different work. You can also do, if you get more mature on this, awesome things with branching which means you have a main branch which you use for actually producing results, you know, research for research papers, that's the master branch along the top, 
And when you're trying to add in a new feature or a new, or a new thing to your code, you create a little branch, try some things out. When that's working, then you merge it back into your thing. That way you can be sure that your experimental, your, your experimental new things added to your code isn't screwing up with the version of the co your code you're keeping safe for doing, you know, doing science with. Okay? So that, when you get more mature, making these branches is awesome. Um, there is a, uh, the easiest way to get started with this is to use something called GitHub. Uh, it's free if you've got open source projects. If you want to keep your work private on it, you normally have to pay a fee. If you get in touch with me, I'm in the process of setting up a UCL account for this. We're not ready to launch this as a proper service yet, but if you want to run, if you want to use this and have a private repository, um, get in touch and we'll talk about how you can access the nascent UCL provision here. Um, on this, you can browse. So this is an example of one project. You can browse through all the, all the changes that colleagues have made on that project, see what changes they've made. Um, the colours are bad on this screen. That's meant to be red and that's meant to be green. Which means these lines were deleted in that particular change and these lines were added in that particular change. Okay, So you can browse through the work and see what people are doing. You can comment on other people's code. So this is a great way of if somebody else is um, doing some work and they've made a change to the model and you want to see, um, and they, they send it to you and they send it, you know, mention to you, can you have a review of that work I did and see what you think of it? Being able to comment in line in, in, in a sort of, um, you know, this is a, a sort of Facebook style interface around the code. Um, that's a really useful for reviewing each other's work and collaborating with colleagues. Um, you can raise bugs against these things and you can use, use these, these issues tracking to manage sort of the to-do list of bugs and new features to add on your work. Um, GitHub also has this great thing called social coding, which is basically you can follow other people and see what, pro what projects they're working on. Um, you can follow projects and see what changes are being made to it. And this is, in programming land, becoming a really good way of sort of building a reputation for yourself, you know, building reputational credit for, for contributing to things. So, you know, there's my profile, you can follow me, the, clicking on that, and then whenever I make a change to it, to some software that's public, it might not be public, it might be private, in which case you'll only see it if you've been added to the list of people that can see it, there's a permissions model that you can see what things. Um, then you can see, uh, then you can basically, you know, see what, see what kind of things I'm up to, uh, which, you know, if this is a researcher whose research you're interested in who works in Australia or America somewhere, and you can see what they're doing on their open source, on their open source models or projects, that can be really valuable. So, uh, recapping then, that's the end of um, what I, uh, I'm just about to come to the end, so we'll do the questions in a minute. That's my top tips, automate everything, automate your tests, do version control, and that's a summary slide of how you can uh, contact us for working with us. That concludes my prepared material, I'm here for lots of conversation. Yes? Um, <coughs> this uh, management applies to all the common languages. Does it apply to Excel? No. This is a problem at the moment. Excel is very hard to version control because in order to version control something successfully, you need to be able to um, basically create deltas between different, um, you know, so here, here's the difference between this and that. And deltaing on uh, XML, uh, Excel files is very difficult. But it will work on VBA? Uh, it will work on... If it's a readable text file, it'll work, basically. Right, so you'd have to convert the VBA code into text. Um, somehow. Yeah, I think, I think, that, I think that, that that can probably be made to work. Um, I believe some people have found workarounds for doing this with Excel. What you can do is, um, if you create a program which generates the Excel spreadsheet and then version control the program. So if you script, you have some VB, some VB script which, um, which, uh, Right. Yeah, which writes that which writes the spread, which creates the spreadsheet and then you version control the VB. Um, I think that, that that's been done successfully. Um, uh, yes, and again, that, that, if you do it that way, then it's easier to do the automated testing. If you want to do an automated testing, then you you can basically make Excel one headless, there are, there are, uh, you know, without opening the GUI, and then that will make make it work. Um, yeah. Uh, model documentation. Like Dax is yeah. Do mm -hmm. you recommend a particular universal formula? Um, I, I don't think there's enough of a difference between them to recommend a particular one. Doing it is definitely better than not doing it. Um, and if you use um, 
if you, you know, one of the nice things about using the, the, the automated nightly runs of your tests thing is that you can actually make this uh, auto generate the dots and put it, and create a web page out of it automatically. So um, every time, we, every night, say it'll run over the code, do the dots and over the code, and upload that into the web for you, so that you've already got a, always got a current dots and of your of your code base. Um, so there's a plugin for, for Jenkins, which is what this software is, which will uh, which will do that. Anything else? Okay. Okay. Um, how do we contact you? Uh, J.heatherington at uc or rc minus soft dev at uc if you want to go for the sort of always staffed um, email address. J.heatherington is H E T H E R I N G. Can you use, are you going to have some. The slides and everything, will, I'll send the slides to, yeah, to, to oh, Will. I'll send them to Ellie. Perfect. Okay, great. I'll do that. Cool. Okay, you can just thank James. For